Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today, we're covering my pick for the best purely lore-friendly build for Astarian in Baldur's Gate 3. This one's for all you lore aficionados who really want to stick very close to the given character classes and lore that's given for the characters, or people who just want to play something a little bit off-meta and experience the game in a new way. For either of those groups, this is going to be an extremely powerful and functional honor mode build, using a class that you don't see used very often in various build guides, but creating a character that has a number of advantages, uh, most notably giving you extremely high levels of utility for your party, very reliable late game control spells, outputting decent damage, and doing all of that while being virtually unkillable. I think that this actually makes for a very smooth playthrough for honor mode because this character is extremely uh, resilient in the face of play errors, mistakes, bad luck, or whatever. You will get lots of options to overcome bad rolls, and this character has a lot of defensive options, so if you act accidentally place them in a bad situation, or the AI does something that you aren't expecting, you can recover from even the worst situations with this character. You also get to feel really smart, because you get to use a, a class that everybody says is bad, um, and it is in fact, when built well, quite good. In fact, the reason that I'm building this character now is that I just recently completed a class tier list for all monoclass builds, and one of the things that I said in that in that tier list was that I rated monoclass rogues quite low. As you know, as soon as I've rate some, rated something low in a tier list, I get the immediate impulse to try to optimize it, to build it, and see how powerful we can make it, and I think we've actually, uh, that this build actually comes out pretty strong overall. It's not going to do as much damage as more damage-focused characters, but the damage damage is still pretty adequate, and the utility is excellent, and it is very, very forgiving for long honor mode playthroughs, which is very important, because honor mode has hundreds of hours of inputs in it, and play mistakes are inevitable, you know, for other players, not for you, um, but for, for everyone else, it's really nice to be able to recover from mistakes that you might make. This build also requires no multi-classing, doesn't use any cheese or broken mechanics, just a viable, powerful, functional build in and of itself, um, or and has very low item requirements, and in fact competes almost not at all for items with other members of your party. This build has very little overlap in terms of the items that it wants with any other character builds that you might want to bring, so it can fit into just about any party. This build is of course based on Astarian's lore, but if you wanted to build it for a main character, it's also pretty good there. It makes a solid party face, which is one of the nice advantages that we get from uh, this version of the build, and so you can definitely build this as your main character, or of course for an origin playthrough for Astarian, this works very well. If you are building it as a main character build, then I recommend taking a half Wood Elf as your character race. Getting access to shield proficiency really does help with the build, because it makes it a little uh, tankier, and that is one of the downsides of playing this build on Astarian, is he won't get shield proficiency, but certainly not required to have that, just probably the best race is half Wood Elf or half Drow for, for particularly that reason, because shield proficiency is so strong for the build. For our ability scores, we are going to actually stick relatively close to Astarian's starting ability scores, although there's two different ways that we could build this. We are going to begin with 16 Dexterity and 16 Constitution. This character gets a lot of damage reduction and various effects that reduce incoming damage, so having 16 Constitution actually helps out a lot. The number of uh, hit points that we get will be multiplied, sort of our effective hit point total will be multiplied a lot. Um, because we're reducing incoming damage significantly through various effects. So even though at the end of the build we won't end up with massive amounts of hit points, our effective hit point total will be huge, and every hit point we get, whether that be from constitution or temporary hit points, is that much more valuable for this character, because we're multiplying the value of each of our hit points significantly. This character will end up actually making a pretty powerful tank at the end of the game, in addition to being a, a, a sneaky attacker as a rogue, and so you are going to which I know sounds a little odd, but you'll see what I mean when we get there. Um, so every hit point we get is that much more valuable on this character. We also now have a choice. If you're using this character as a party face, and I think one of the cool things about it is you get to use this character as a party face, thanks to great skill access and Rogue's reliable talent and everything, you want to take 14 Charisma, and we will grab Intelligence using the circlet, uh, the warped headband of Intellect. Um, 
Warped Headband of Intellect is perfect for this character, because we want a bit of intelligence, but we don't need 20. Almost every character that wants intelligence, or almost every character wants either 20 intelligence or 8. And so the Warped Headband, despite being a pretty powerful effect, just setting your intelligence to 17, doesn't actually show up in a lot of builds, or it isn't actually that important to a lot of builds, because most characters don't really want 16 intelligence, or 17, but it's the same as 16. This build actually does just fine with 16 intelligence, and so the Warped Headband is perfect for this build. We can get away with taking 8 intelligence and not be stealing an important item from any other character, the way we would be if we were taking, say, the Gloves of Dexterity that a lot of char different characters would want. Of course, if you don't want to use this as a party face, you can just take 14 intelligence, and then you'll be just fine with intelligence, and then we'll spend our remaining uh, points on wisdom. For our skill selection, we almost certainly want expertise in sleight of hand and stealth. Really good to be able to have those. Uh, a sleight of hand expertise is one of the great things that rogues bring to your party alongside high dexterity. This means you'll always pass your sleight of hand checks, which is really awesome. Both breaks the economy of the game in half by being able to pickpocket, and also means that you'll never take damage from traps, which saves your party resources over the course of the run. And then we probably just take our dialogue skills if we're going for the charisma version of the character. Um, you can also put this point into insight and have that if you prefer it to intimidation. You usually won't need deception, intimidation, and persuasion, all three, although it can be nice to have them just because for role-playing reasons. But uh, I would probably pick Deception, Insight, and Persuasion. The fact that Astarian gets Perception from Race is also really nice, because just having a, another proficient in Perception character with 12 Wisdom in the party means you'll pass checks looking for traps more often. Since this guy is going to be disabling all the traps, finding them is very important. Other than that, no other decisions to make at level 1. Let's go to level 2. At character level 2, we don't have to make any more uh, decisions about our character, because of course we don't get any choices at Rogue level 2, but we do get three extremely important actions that are going to be critical to playing this character going forward. So it's worth under taking the time to understand these three bonus actions, how they work, and how they're going to impact your play moving forward, because they're a core component of both your offensive and defensive setup for this character. Cunning Action Hide lets you hide as a bonus action. So if you're out of an enemy line of sight, um, you can hide as a bonus action. This is a way to guarantee that you get sneak attack and also get advantage on your next shot. Rogue's main downside is that they don't get multiple attacks. They only get a single attack per round, and they need to land that attack every round in order to land their sneak attack damage. Otherwise, they are not doing any damage and losing out on the main advantage of playing a rogue, which is the high burst damage that you get from sneak attack. Cunning Action Hide gives you the ability to almost guarantee landing your sneak attack every turn by using your hide bonus action and then attacking. You can combine this with ways to generate concealment or cover, like fog cloud, to hide inside of the, the fog cloud. Um, if you need to in certain arenas, you can also combine it with things like minor illusion to make sure that you have the enemies facing the other way, uh, or just simply by moving your characters past them. If you have a melee character, you can move it to the other side of the enemy from your rogue. The enemy will turn to face your melee character in order to fight them, and then your rogue will be able to cunning action hide without being in line of sight of any enemies, guaranteeing you a sneak attack um, and, and a shot with advantage. Of course, if your melee character's in melee with the enemy, you'll have sneak attack, but the advantage is still very important. Cunning Action Dash means that you're more mobile than every other character, and also means that any bonuses that you get that affect your mobility are even more valuable on the rogue. So things like Long Strider or Haste are worth double value in terms of movement distance on rogues, because you can make two movement actions every single turn. And Cunning Action Disengage means that if you get into range of an enemy, and sometimes you will want to make a melee attack, even though this is a ranged build primarily. You can make melee attacks if you have a dagger equipped or other finesse weapon. Uh, you can make that melee attack and then disengage. You can also, if an enemy runs up next to you, disengage and then fire without taking disadvantage. This is really important because it'll let us skip crossbow expert or any of the other feats that normally would require you to, that you'd normally need to fight without disadvantage in melee with ranged weapons, but as a rogue you can just disengage and then fire your, your weapons from far away. So all three of these are critically important, it's important to understand how they're used, and they'll be very important for this build. 
at character level 3. We get to pick our subclass, and the subclass that we're going to pick, as the game suggests for Astarian, is Arcane Trickster. This fits, of course, with his rogue, with his lore, because he's a rogue who's looking for arcane power, the perfect setup for Arcane Trickster. Arcane Trickster gets a few things. One, you get Mage Hand, and you get uh, Legere Domain, which means that the Mage Hand is invisible. In some ways, this is actually a downside, because one of the best uses of Mage Hand is to absorb an enemy attack, um, and the invisible Mage Hand won't usually be attacked by enemies, although, of course, enemies who can see invisibility will still attack it. Mage Hand has tons of uses in various situations. Um, but the best use is probably dropping a stack of potions, casting Mage Hand, and then your Mage Hand can throw those potions to your teammates to be an extra heal. This gives you a lot of additional utility just by virtue of having Mage Hand, um, although it does take some micro, so don't do it if you're not interested in doing the micro. You can also throw bombs at enemies, although the enemies will attack a stack of bombs on the ground and blow them up if they're next to your character. The reason this works so well is that you can precast the Mage Hand before combat and then drop the, the potions or whatever as a free action. It doesn't take an action to drop them. So you can throw things uh, and get the extra heal without actually spending actions on your turn. For our cantrip selection, otherwise, we have actually a couple different options here. We, if we're going to be a party face, should almost certainly take friends. Of course, on honor mode, you need to be careful when and where you use this, or make sure to leave the area after using it, but it's an extremely powerful effect, and turns your 14 charisma and proficiency into almost guaranteed successes on most um, most roles, especially when combined with guidance from an ally. And then if you have Minor Illusion elsewhere in your party, you don't need it on this character, although this character benefits really heavily from Minor Illusion, so if you don't, you should definitely take it. If you do have Minor Illusion elsewhere, um, then you should take Blade Ward, because that actually works very well with this character's theme of being tanky. When we're having damage from Blade Ward and having damage from Uncanny Dodge, we're only taking a quarter damage from attacks, which means that we are going to be able to resist a lot of effects. You can put this character in a bad situation, um, and enemies will often attack them because they have relatively low hit points, are often concentrating on a spell, and so you can draw enemy aggro this way, but you'll be reducing the damage so much that that's actually good for you if you want to take a hit on this character. For our spell selection, we get to choose from Illusion and Enchantment spells. Again, you should take Disguise Self, because it's a it's a ritual spell, um, so it doesn't cost you a spell slot, works very well with being the party face. And then the other spells here don't matter that much. At this stage of the game, sleep is pretty useless, so... Uh, and we don't really want spells that use saving throws yet, so... I'm just going to say that you could take um, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, or I guess in theory you could try Color Spray, although it's pretty bad. It is kind of fun with sneak attacks, but not something that you would normally want to use. Tasha's won't come up now, but might come up later, but we'll swap this out later on anyways. But the real uh, juice here is the expanded spell list, where you get to pick from not just Illusion and Enchantment spells, and this lets us get Shield. Shield is incredibly powerful on martial characters, because we're going to have great AC since we're a dexterity-based character, um, and this gives us a reaction that can just negate enemy attacks. This makes combines with our theme of becoming even tankier, so that this character is actually extremely difficult to kill when you have reactions available. I had to pause the video for a second there because I was attacked by the world's most powerful sneeze, and I didn't want to inflict that on you guys. Alright, let's go on to the next level. At level 4, we get a feat, and like most ranged builds, the feat that we want to take immediately is Sharpshooter. Now, this character doesn't have uh, archery fighting style, so we are less likely to hit with our Sharpshooter attacks than most characters, but Sharpshooter still works out mathematically to being way more average damage per turn um, than taking a an ability improvement at this point. Even aside from the not taking penalties shooting at high ground, against most enemies, Sharpshooter is going to be more damage. A good rule of thumb is you should turn Sharpshooter off if your hit chance is uh, 30% or less, otherwise you're doing more average damage. Now that does decrease a little bit as you level up with Rogue and, and you want to... Um, apply your sneak attack more, but at this level, our sneak attack damage is significantly less than our sharpshooter damage on average, and so we're better off just guaranteeing that we get sharpshooter hits, and you're gonna 
lean into sharpshooter attacks more. Also remember that we should have advantage on every attack we're making thanks to bonus action hides, so we're going to hit very regularly with our sharpshooter attacks. People are, I think, too cautious about um, turning off sharpshooter, but you will do more average damage and more burst damage, which is very important, if you leave sharpshooter on most of the time. And then, of course, use advantage and other uh, hit mechanics. Of course, Astarian, as well, has his happy buff to help off offset the penalty, and you will do way more average damage over time. Um, by the time we're level 12, you're going to want to turn off Sharpshooter if your hit chance is something like 50% or less, because at that point, our landing sneak attack is so much more valuable. But Sharpshooter is still really, really important in the early game. Next, we're just going to take another spell. Uh, you can take something at random here because we'll replace it as soon as we possibly can. And here we're going to replace Tasha's Hideous Laughter because we are, we don't want spells that have save DCs since our intelligence is going to be low. We just want utility spells, and we're going to replace that with a utility spell. Long Strider, if you don't have it elsewhere in your party, is incredible for this character. It doesn't require a spell slot, so you, it gives you more shields to use. Enhanced Leap, similarly, is a ritual that you can use to make yourself way more mobile, or your, the rest of your party way, way more mobile, um, and doesn't take spell slots. So both of those are extremely powerful. If you don't have them elsewhere in your party, they're very good. Surprisingly good on this character is False Life. Seven temporary hit points is not much, and this is normally not a great use of a spell slot, but for this character who has so much, so many forms of damage reduction, False Life is actually surprisingly decent um, if you don't have other ways of generating temporary hit points for your character. Um, but in general, you're going to want to take Long Strider if you don't have access to it, and if you do have access to it, take Fog Cloud, because as I mentioned previously, you can bonus action hide in the Fog Cloud, um, which makes you effectively immune to ranged attacks, since enemies will not be able to, you'll always have cover and can always hide. Um, and especially if you then combine it with immunity to blind, you gain even more advantages that way. Fog Cloud won't block ranged attacks the way darkness will, but if you hide in it, then it's effective. You can use it as a pseudo darkness, which is very powerful. At rogue level 5, your sneak attack goes up to 3d6, and you also get Uncanny Dodge. Uncanny Dodge is a passive ability that when you are hit will use your reaction. It does take your reaction to have incoming damage. As we talked about previously, you can combine this with Blade Ward to take one quarter damage from uh, any physical damage attack, and that includes magical attacks, um, as long as they do slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning damage. And while it does conflict a little bit with shield in that they both require your reaction, this basically lets you, if the attack could be blocked by shield, take zero damage from it, and if it's not blocked by shield, take half damage from it. That means that almost every incoming attack is doing significantly less average damage to you, and your effective hit point total is much, much higher than most other characters because of all the defensive options that this character gets. We also get to replace a spell, and we're going to replace whatever we picked last level with another powerful utility spell. In this case, we'll take Enhanced Leap if we don't have access to that somewhere else, but if we do, we can grab Fog Cloud. Rogue level 6. We can... Uh, make some skill swaps, but we we don't want to, because uh, we, we just want to keep our skill proficiencies. Um, but we do get to change out some spells. However, at this point, this spell list is perfect, unless we've gotten access to these rituals elsewhere. So if you have, grab Fog Cloud. If you haven't, just keep these spells uh, the way they are. At Rogue level 7, we get Evasion, which means that we are now, in addition to being very, very resilient to enemy attacks, also very resilient to damaging spells. Since we will have excellent dexterity saving throws, we are going to take no damage from most enemy damaging spells, and even if they do somehow get through our excellent saving throws, we'll only take half damage, meaning that we are very resistant to damage. Basically, the only thing at this point that puts this character in danger is controlling effects, um, wisdom targeting saving throws or con targeting saving throws that just take your character out completely. Uh, but any damage-based attacks against this character, you'll be able to pretty safely ignore. If you combine it with a healer, somewhere in your party or just some form of healing any damage you do take you'll be able to heal up pretty quickly or you can just drink potions and this character will be extremely safe and resilient throughout your honor mode run 
We also get access to level 2 spells, and we can continue that theme of taking powerful defensive options by grabbing Mirror Image. You can precast this before combat again, and this will mean that your character has, in combination with having great dexterity, incredible AC. Adding plus 9 to your armor class, even if it does slowly decrease over time, means that the first three attacks against you are basically always going to miss, um, especially because if they do happen to roll a very high roll, you can shield against them. And then any that do hit, are take you're taking one half or one quarter damage from, so your character is very, very difficult to bring down. We can also replace a spell with a level 2 spell, although honestly I think we're pretty happy with the spell list the way it is still. Again, if you've gotten these rituals elsewhere, you can pick up other uh, useful utility level 2 spells. For example, you can pick up Invisibility, which is of course very good for this character, Blur for even more defensive capabilities, or if you just feel like you really need some guaranteed damage, Cloud of Daggers is good. A little less good to pick up at this level, but still very useful. Misty Step for this character is excellent, obviously, because it's always excellent for every character, but less important for this character than for other um for other characters, and especially then for other marshals, because you get the bonus action dash, which in many cases is as good as Misty Step. Now, uh, you're never wrong to take Misty Step, so you should consider it, especially if you don't have an, if your items of Misty Step are on your other party members. Um, almost every character should get access to this spell eventually, but it's it's worth noting that it is slightly less important for this character than other characters. I'd still probably strive to get one of these ritual spells from some other source and then pick up uh, Misty Step instead, but just worth noting that if, if you can't do that, it's not a total disaster. At Rogue Level 8, we get another feat, and we also get another expanded spell list pick, but for our feat, we're just going to pick up Ability Improvement. You can get to 18 dexterity here and be landing your attacks much more often, and that's very useful as well. And then for our expanded spell list pick, we'll just pick up another utility spell like Invisibility, for example. Now our spell list is basically perfect, so we don't need to replace anything at this point. At level 9, this character's ability, this character's playstyle changes significantly because you get access to Magical Ambush. This is why we want to have the Warped Headband of Intellect and grab 16 Intelligence, because um, if you give enemies disadvantage on saving throws against your spells, your effective save DC is going to be somewhere around, if you, it with 16 Intelligence, is going to be somewhere around if another character had 24 Intelligence. It's an enormous boost to the, your ability to land spells, and makes you actually extremely able to land uh, spells while hidden. You can bonus action hide, and then land a powerful control spell on an enemy, making it almost guaranteed to land a powerful disable. And, as it so happens, you have one of the most powerful disables in the game available right away, so let's pick up um, whichever one of these spells we no longer need because we have access to it somewhere else, and we're going to grab Hold Person. This means that from hiding, we can initiate combat with Hold Person, basically guarantee that it lands, because enemies will have disadvantage on the saves, and we can use save DC boosting items if we want. Um, but in general, even without abusing Arcane Acuity, this is the most reliable, or without abusing Arcane Acuity, this is the most reliable way to land Hold Person, the most debilitating control spell in the game. And if you land Hold Person on someone, and have two hand crossbows equipped, or a, an offhand hand crossbow equipped, you can land hold person from hiding, basically guaranteed to land, and then make a guaranteed sneak attack critical with your bonus action offhand attack against that enemy. Guaranteed criticals with sneak attack are incredible amounts of damage, and that is going to mean that this character suddenly does tons of burst damage and has access to really great control spells. You can also, if you need the control spell refreshed or on a different target, or just need it, it in combat and started your combat without casting it, bonus action hide and then land the hold person with disadvantage, which is incredibly powerful as well. This also works on scrolls, so any spell that you have from a scroll will cast off your intelligence and will work for disadvantage, will work uh, with magical ambush to give enemies disadvantage on saving throws, so this character is suddenly the best character at using scrolls in the entire game. 
Rogue level 10, we get to take another feat, because rogues get another bonus feat at level 10. So just like fighters, we get four feats over the course of a monoclass build. A little later, but it's it's still really nice. Um, for this feat, we have two options, actually. One is to boost our dexterity to 20. Another is if we are using the cat's grace armor, and so just already have 20 dexterity, which is a, a possible best-in-slot armor for this character, we can stay at 18 dexterity and pick up another feat. Some other feats that are really good for this character are alert, of course, because it's just excellent for every character. Um, but there's also some others for this character that are uniquely interesting for this character. Lucky combines with this character's theme of being extremely reliable and unkillable. It's going to give you uh, basically immunity to enemy critical hits, because you can use this against enemy critical hits um, to prevent them from critically hitting you with the lucky uh, points. You can also give gain advantage on attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws. Advantage on attack rolls handily lets you trigger sneak attack, even if for whatever reason you can't hide. It's probably not usually worth a lucky point for that, but it is definitely an option. Um, you you don't, don't usually want to use this on skill checks or saving throws, but for some really important skill checks, you can. And luck points are really nice for this character and make you extremely reliable at passing various skill checks. Another fun feat that you don't see used very often but is actually very good for this character is mobile because um, you get additional movement speed and difficult terrain doesn't slow you down when you dash that means that your bonus action dashes can go over difficult terrain really easily um, the if you move after making a melee attack you don't provoke is not that important but additional movement speed is so good for this character because it's doubled in value and the ability to go over difficult terrain can work really well with say plant growth from an ally to make a, a party comp based around difficult terrain where this character can be extremely evasive by passing through your own difficult terrain or difficult terrain that's on the field. That's uh, probably not what I would recommend, but it is a really fun feat that doesn't see a lot of use, and this character makes great use of it, so I wanted to mention it. The best by default is probably uh, alert or of uh, lucky, or of course just taking 20 dexterity, but we're going to just grab 20 dexterity assuming that the Cat's Grace Armor is somewhere else. That said, the Cat's Grace Armor is a great item that most other characters won't be competing for, so you can probably pick that up. For our spell selection here, um, none of these are particularly good for us. Blur is a, a nice defensive spell that we can concentrate on, and one fun thing about Blur, actually, is that enemies are less likely to attack you while they have disadvantage against you, but are more likely to attack you when you're concentrating on a spell. Um, and that means that it actually doesn't prevent enemies from attacking you. So if your goal is to be really hard to hit and get enemies attacking you, Blur is a good thing to concentrate on, because they'll try to hit you to cancel your concentration on Blur, even though that doesn't matter. It's just a good way to manipulate the AI, and very, I, I feel, tricky and in theme for an arcane trickster rogue. Crown of Madness, if you can land it, um, it's it's a little buggy, but it does make enemies attack each other, and that is very useful as well. I think that Blur is overall your best pick. Uh, we also get another bonus cantrip, so we'll just take whatever utility we don't need at this point. If you had to take Minor Illusion on this character because you didn't get it elsewhere in the build, then you can pick up uh, Blade Ward at this point, but I really like having Blade Ward for the entire run of this character, so probably we'll just pick up kind of whatever feels best to us at this point. We're still not landing cantrip attacks because our intelligence isn't very high, so we never want to take the attacking cantrips, but you could pick up anything and we'll go with True Strike just to annoy people in the comments, as I so often love to do. At Rogue Level 11, we get Reliable Talent, meaning that we are, as a party face, even though we only have 14 Charisma, almost guaranteed to pass every single dialogue check in the game at this point, um, as well as just you're, you will never miss on disarming traps. You'll never miss on opening locks. Reliable talent is just incredible for a skill monkey character like this. And for our spell selection, again, this is not that important, but we can pick up Crown of Madness. You'll almost always be using... Um, or Tasha's Hideous Laughter is also pretty good against certain bosses. I'd probably take Tasha's, actually. I'm, I'm rethinking this. Tasha's is just good against bosses and, and works against characters that Hold Person doesn't work against. You can land it quite reliably. 
And finally, at level 12, we get to take another feat. And if we have already taken uh, an ability improvement to 20, then or have chosen not to, then we can take an, uh, one of the other feats like Lucky or Alert. I'm going to suggest taking Lucky, because this character obviously benefits from Alert. Alert is just a broken feat and super powerful on every character. Going first is awesome. But um, this character uniquely uses Lucky very well, and also already has quite good initiative with plus five decks. I think that Alert is probably the more powerful pick of the two, but Lucky feels good lore-wise for Astarian, and it's just nice to be able to use feats that don't see a lot of use. Um, rather than spamming alert on every single build. So when you put it all together, you get a character that, while it does less raw damage than a more damage-focused character, you can, of course, check out any of my other Astarian Archer builds for more damage-focused versions of the build. Um... It does its damage extremely consistently and extremely reliably. In fact, that's the thing that this character does best, is be consistent and reliable. The damage is very consistent, the control is extremely consistent to land, because enemies will have disadvantage on the saving throws. And, of course, you get reliable talent, meaning that you're making all your skill checks uh, with extreme consistency and basically cannot fail most skill checks, which is incredibly powerful. You also get... Um, access to you, you also basically cannot die in combat so you're doing all of the extremely consistent things that this character does while almost never in danger of actually dying the only thing that really threatens you is control spells like hold person for example is pretty bad for you but other than that you're very very unlikely to die through damage which makes this character a really smooth and safe way to play through honor mode, and a great addition to your party. You also get access to a couple really broken mechanics in ways that are actually uniquely good for this character. One thing that you get access to is reliable talent, right? And the lowest result you can roll on a skill check is 10. Well, skill checks are used in combat in one very special way, greater invisibility. Greater invisibility lets you make attacks before combat starts and stay invisible so you can continuously make attacks as long as you pass stealth checks of increasing difficulty every time. Well, those stealth checks start at DC 15, and this character has, without any like items or anything, we have uh, plus 13 stealth. That means that the lowest that we can roll on our stealth check for greater invisibility is 23, so we can never fail the first stealth check. The second is DC 17, so we can never fail that one, and then it goes up by one. So we need to, to make eight attacks before we can ever fail a single roll on greater invisibility, and even then only on a natural one, which we can re-roll with Lucky, or if we're a halfling we can re-roll it, meaning that we are almost certain to get off our 10 attacks from uh, greater invisibility. Obviously 10 stealth attacks, because it only lasts 10 rounds, right? Obviously 10 stealth attacks is enough to win pretty much any combat, and so this character does that with perfect efficiency and never has to actually roll dice to use one of the most broken mechanics in the game. We can also buff up this character significantly with items, although, as I mentioned previously, it's not very item-reliant and doesn't really compete for items with other, mem uh, other members of the party, but of course there's lots of different options for how we build it. In fact, how we build the character in terms of... Um, in terms of equipment or weapons, matters a lot for how we're going to play. Your typical play pattern is either going to be fire off a hold person and then fire off a guaranteed critical from your offhand hand crossbow, or fire off a main hand attack and then an offhand um, ring of the band of the mystic scoundrel spell. Now, the band of the mystic scoundrel spells won't have the the save disadvantage, but you can still cast the utility spells, and so this is a really useful really powerful way to use Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, still very powerful, but not broken or abusive the way the Sword Bard version of this is. So you get to use one of the more fun items in the game without using it in an abusive way by firing off an attack with, say, the Titan String Bow or the Deadshot, and then using your bonus action to cast something like Mirror Image. I think that's a much more fun and and a way to use the band, and much closer to how it was intended to be used. And so I actually think this character is one of the best uh, best carriers, best in the sense of most, <laughs> most appropriate, most ethical, I guess, carriers of one of the most broken items in the game. So you can still have fun with this item without just ruining the game for yourself by making it too easy. 
Of course, you do still benefit from the Helm of Arcane Acuity, another broken mechanic, but again, you get to use this in a way that's less broken and more sort of how it's intended, because you only make one attack per round, and so you can stack a little bit of Arcane Acuity and just make your hold persons much more reliable. Um, but mostly the items that you're going to need are just good hand crossbows, because you will typically want to make an offhand hand crossbow attack after landing a hold person. You are going to want um, the warped headband of intellect to give you 16 or 17 but effectively 16 intelligence to make your hold persons land reliably if you are a race that has shield proficiency you'll want a shield that either gives you save dcs like this one or initiative both of those are very good because you can have a shield equipped while having ranged weapons equipped still benefit from the ac and that makes goes very well with your goal of being tankier. But mostly this character just needs spell DC items, anything that increases your damage per shot, like the flawed Helldusk gloves is still good for you, but not required, because overall this character is extremely item independent and does what it does without needing any specific items. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this video. And of course, as always, if you have, feel free to leave a comment, like the video. Both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm here on YouTube, getting more people to see my stuff um, and keeping the Baldur's Gate community thriving. And uh, as always, you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. And I'll catch you next time. Cheers, folks. GG.